Right. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all very much indeed for uh, joining. Uh, welcome to this, this webinar on neurotechnology for dementia. Um, my name is Charlie Winkler-Smith, and I lead the Neurotechnology Innovation Network at the KTN. So I'll just run through the webinar protocol. Um, as there are quite a few people uh, registered for this, um, all participants will be muted. Um, but if you've got any technical problems at all, then please do use the chat box and my colleague uh, Poonam should be able to help you. Um, if you have any questions for the speakers, then please do use the Q&A box. Um, there'll be plenty of time for questions after each uh, presentation. And just to note that the webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch this uh, on YouTube later um, as well. So I'll just run through the agenda. I'm going to give a, a very brief uh, introduction. We'll then hear from Professor Paul Matthews, who's going to give us an introduction to the UK Dementia Research Institute. We'll then hear a clinician's perspective from Dr. Richard Perry. Uh, Dr. Rihanna McArdle will be discussing wearable technology as a, as a clinical tool for dementia. And then we'll hear from Dr. Brian Murphy about in-home measurement of cognitive performance in healthy aging. Um, as you can see, there are Q&A sessions after each presentation. So please do uh, remember to, to type your questions into the Q&A box and then we'll be uh, finishing with a panel discussion. So if you're new to the uh, KTN's Neurotechnology Innovation Network, or, or what used to be called the Special Interest Group, um, welcome to all of you. Um, our aim really is to bring together and grow the neurotechnology community in the UK. So we're, we're here to help if you're an academic and you're looking for industry partners, or, or you're uh, working for a company and you're looking for technical experts or perhaps um, access to, to funding and finance, then please do get in touch and, and hopefully we can make some, some useful connections. And it'd be great just to, to find out more about your work. We've got uh, more webinars coming up as well. So on the 13th of October, we have neurotechnology capabilities. So you'll hear from the Henry Royce Institute and how they can help with materials design the Centre for Process Innovation will be discussing how they can help you commercialise your wearable device. And then the Maisy facility, the manufacture of active implant and surgical instruments facility, uh, will be discussing how they can help you commercialise your, uh, your implants. And Anne will also be uh, announcing a really exciting call. On the 12th of November, we also have a quantum magnetic sensors for brain imaging webinar, which should be uh, really interesting. So that's all from me. Um, it's my absolute pleasure now to introduce Professor Paul Matthews, who is the Centre Director of the UK Dementia Research Institute at Imperial. He's the head of, of the Department of Brain Sciences at Imperial and also the chair for the MRC Neurosciences and Mental Health Board. Um, his cutting edge research combines brain imaging, genomics, and other cutting edge techniques to research inflammatory mechanisms in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Paul's going to give us an overview of the UK Dementia Research Institute. So over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to join you here today and to participate in this uh, KTN um, webinar. Uh, as Charlie said, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the UK Dementia Research Institute, but let me start by just reminding all of you that as we live through the COVID pandemic, uh, the pandemic of dementia has not gone away. Currently, there are over 850,000 people in the UK who are living with dementia. Uh, there are over 5 million people in the US. Um, and over 50 million people globally. Uh, by 2050, uh, the number is expected globally to reach almost 150 million. Uh, this is a massive problem and it's going to need uh, transformative approaches. Um, uh, it's a fantastic opportunity for the private and the public sector. Uh, following David Cameron's challenge for uh, and call 
to dementia uh, in the UK in 2008. Uh, there has been a three-pronged three approach developed um, in this country. Uh, the first was to um, superpower uh, data integration at a population level, um, uh, uh, linking cohorts across the country, uh, led by the Dementia Platforms UK, which is now in its second five-year cycle. Uh, more recently, from 2017, the UK Dementia Research Institute was set up, which is which I'll describe in a moment. Uh, this is uh, to superpower the paths from uh, fundamental discovery of mechanisms uh, towards their translation to tools uh, for therapeutics. And finally, um, underpinning both of these has been uh, and continues to be uh, the Dementia uh, Translational Research Collaboration uh, led across UK institutions and biomedical research centers by the NIHR. Well, I'm going to focus on the UK Dementia Research Institute or the DRI. This is a, uh, a novel uh, network. Um, it is a virtual institute intended to have a very long life over decades uh, that was established by the UKRI Medical Research Council in conjunction with the Alzheimer's Society and Alzheimer's Research UK. Uh, the headquarters for the UK DRI are in uh, at UCL in central London, uh, where it is led by uh, Professor Bart de Stroper, who was recruited from uh, uh, University of Louvain in Belgium, an internationally um, uh, highly recognized and decorated uh, Alzheimer's researcher. Uh, unlike most uh, MRC institutes, such as the um, uh, MRC uh, Laboratory for Molecular Biology in Cambridge. This institute is um, uh, a virtual institute distributed across six UK uh, universities, Edinburgh, Cambridge, King's, um, Imperial and Cardiff, as well as UCL. Uh, the intention of this is to leverage uh, better uh, the strengths uh, and funding from the academic uh, research um, found, uh, enterprise within the UK in order to uh, better match uh, funds um, uh, put forward by the, um, uh, the founders. The objectives overall for the UK DRI um, are to uh, readdress fundamental questions of earliest disease pathogenesis, uh, to um, uh, uh, develop novel targets um, for uh, therapeutic uh, exploitation, uh, to validate them, and then to take the first steps towards their translation. Uh, Imperial College has been um, immensely successful within uh, this, high, this competitive uh, network as it was set up. Uh, we were one of the founding centers with the UK uh, Dementia Research Institute Center uh, at Imperial College that is um, intended to, uh, uh, that I lead, and that is intended to capture early phase discovery and its uh, 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 early translation. I'll describe it in more detail in a moment. And then more recently, uh, we have established the only uh, care research and technology center in the network. Um, uh, led by uh, Professor David Sharp, uh, which is to really transform approaches to uh, dementia care uh, at a patient level. But let me take you back to understand, uh, first of all, what we're doing in the uh, UK DRI Center at ICL, uh, the uh, Basic Discovery Center. Our focus is on understanding the translation, the transition point from susceptibility to disease, to try to move the clock back uh, understand what it is um, that environment and lifestyle are doing, uh, acting on the genetic background of individuals uh, to initiate uh, the um, uh, pathology that eventually leads to the disease. By doing so, what we're trying to do is find ways of packaging positive elements of lifestyle and environment uh, as molecules or pills uh, to create um, uh, better preventative uh, and ameliorative strategies. Our particular focus, illustrated in the lower right, is on the glial cells, um, those cells that are more abundant in the brain than neurons uh, and that have been relatively neglected 
But in fact, um, these cells and the microglial cell, the immune-like cell in the brain, um, are those that express the greatest proportion of the genes that have been associated with Alzheimer's disease. Our approach is highly integrative. We start at a population health level, uh, move through understanding of biomarkers, uh, developing new tools using epigenomics to understand how environment and lifestyle influence genes, how sleep um, and circadian rhythms uh, have an effect uh, on circuits um, and behaviors, and then how we can begin uh, modify uh, circuit dysfunction using bioelectronic medicine approaches. Um, it is multi-tool, um, multi-scale, going from populations through early experimental medicine to molecular pathology, and of course, always exploiting models. What is important about our, all of the centers within the DRI and our center uh, is that we are highly open um, in our science. Uh, we are creating a more and more transparent, uh, data uh, open data sharing environment, and we are keen to work with industry um, globally. Uh, we have uh, already a strong uh, international uh, commercial uh, interactions with companies such as Nestle, Biogen. Um, uh, we have a number of uh, international uh, academic collaborations as well. Uh, a centerpiece of our program that illustrates some of the strategy is uh, the UK DRI Brain Atlas, where we're trying to develop a molecular, a cell by cell molecular map of what goes on uh, when people make are at this transition point uh, from being uh, at risk of dementia by virtue of their genes to beginning to develop the early pathology. This is involving. Um, taking uh, a molecular uh, approach to neuropathology using many techniques simultaneously on the same tissues. Um, this has involved development of some novel technologies. One of the most important of these has been led by uh, Zoltan Takash, uh, in, uh, the, uh, who leads uh, the Imperial Department uh, the Imperial Phenome Sciences uh, Unit, and this is relying on um, extension of desorption electrospray ionization mass spectrometry methods uh, to be able to probe the spatial distribution of metabolic and lipidomic changes in the brain. What you see over on the bottom left, um, for example, is half of a section of a hemisphere uh, from the mouse brain uh, the areas that are colored represent the cortex, where the, the molecules of interest uh, are found. The uh, DESI-MS technique uh, it produces for each picture element, the small squares that you see, uh, a mass spectrometry readout from which uh, different chemical compositions can be decoded uh, by uh, big data techniques. Um, in a reproducible fashion uh, to develop a map uh, on at least the level of small clusters of cells of metabolic changes across the Alzheimer's brain. This is being this and related technologies are being translated into bioelectronic approaches. Nia Grossman has developed a novel approach to temporal interference brain stimulation that allows uniquely deep stimulation in the brain non-invasively through looking at the interference between uh, safe, uh, low energy, um, uh, alternating current provided by electrodes placed on the surface of the brain. Let me just walk through uh, the kind of approach that he's taken, which illustrates what we're doing for uh, initiating translation of these tools. He showed first that he could stimulate deep in the brain of a mouse. If you, um, he applied electrodes using tacks to the surface of the mouse uh, head, uh, entirely non-invasively. Over on the right-hand side, you see that glowing green deep in the hippocampus of the brain. Those are cells expressing CFOS, a marker of activity. Those cells were selectively stimulated by externally applied electrodes um, uh, non-invasively. 
Uh, he, has, he showed uh, also in the mouse that he could steer this by adjusting the currents. I won't go in that in detail, making the mouse whiskers move, and then has moved from there to human translation. Here you see uh, fMRI patterns on the far right, where you see the bright yellow squares that show how he can steer activation areas across the cortex of the brain entirely non-invasively, deeply. Uh, this is now being extended to um, a clinical uh, phase to a clinical trial funded uh, by the Alzheimer's Association in the US that is targeting ways of enhancing neural activity deep in the hippocampus and by doing so sort of exercising the neurons that are beginning to fail uh, with Alzheimer's disease in an effort to improve their bioenergetics their energy supplies uh, and the release of neurotrophic or neuroprotective molecules in order to reverse or slow degeneration. Um, the Care and Technology Center, uh, led by David Sharp, is pursuing um, more, trans more directly translational approaches, uh, cost-effective monitoring uh, uh, technologies uh, that are uh, accessible to patients in the home, secure artificial intelligence methods uh, that can um, uh, allow uh, patients to manage their health longer at home, robotic devices, uh, moving the point of care to the home for personalized medicine, and, and always doing so in a way that both produces technology and enhances discovery. He's pulled together a really remarkable team across Imperial and the University of Surrey, working on biosensors, synthetic biology for point of care diagnostics, robotics, um, sleep, uh, and behavior. An example of the output of this has been Payam Benaghi's uh, development of the UK DRI home digital platform, which is wiring homes with a variety of um, micro radar systems uh, that um, are allowing tracking of where people are, how they're behaving, um, and um, uh, integrating that with uh, measurements of temperature, uh, activity levels by sensors on the people uh, and other data, uh, transferring that to a central uh, site for monitoring uh, that using AI algorithms develops alerts passed on directly to the GPs um, for contact with the patients by phone so that uh, problems that are developing such as an, uh, a, a urinary tract infection in people who are uh, less able to report them can be identified and treated uh, within hours of their um, uh, appearance as symptoms. This is all exciting. The DRI uh, is um, uh, uh, open for business now across all of its six universities uh, and seven centers. Um, uh, it's looking for academic and industry partners, um, and I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That, that was really, really interesting. Um, can I just uh, remind everyone that uh, if you have any questions, then, then please do type them into the uh, Q&A box and we'll, we'll try and get through all of those. Um, Paul, how, how important is it for for you and, and the UK DRI to, to be working with industry at a very early stage? Uh, it's tremendously important. Um, uh, our view is that we can provide the proof of principles, but those proof of principles need to be um, really carried into um, full proof of concept and then developed in a way that can be spread to a mass audience. Um, that's not something for the research enterprise to do. That's something that we need to do uh, in close partnership with industry. So we're, we hope that we can lay foundations that industry can then realize uh, benefits for patients uh, uh, from. So, something that's been in the news a bit is, is um, how many drug companies are pulling out of dementia research that they've been stung from various trials. Do you think there's an opportunity then for a neurotechnology approach? Um, so you, you were mentioning deep brain stimulation. Do you think that might be one of the, the keys to, to treating dementia versus a, a pharmaceutical approach? 
Well, I think it's not one or the other. I think they're both high risk. Um, what we're doing here is trying to harness the power of the public sector to do some of the high risk early research um, to establish the proof of principles and then make do this in an open way that allows industry to pick it up and run with it. I think bioelectronics is really exciting because the path to translation uh, is potentially fast uh, and much faster than with molecules. And moreover, uh, it has the opportunity to harness some of the body's own neuroprotective mechanisms uh, in ways that uh, both reduce adverse event risks and, um, uh, and potentially enhance the approach to um, uh, multi-targeted uh, uh, therapy uh, quickly. We, we have a question here from Raj Sharma about what, what is the process to become an industry partner? Well, I think there, there are probably, Raj, there are probably two um, strategies. One is to um, uh, uh, identify just through scanning the, the websites, the literature, um, research in a given center that is of interest and contact the uh, investigator involved. I think a more general approach is to contact DRI centrally uh, and Kate Pericud, P-E-R-I-C-U-D, who can be reached through the main um, UK DRI website. You can find her email. Is a great person. She's there as an industry contact. She's been in industry um, uh, and academia both. Uh, and she's there to help lead industry partners in and, um, and show them the different ways in which they can work closely from the beginning or begin to exploit opportunities developed by the UK DRI. We have a, an, another question here about the partnerships uh, from Julie Taylor um, from the DIT. Um, she's wondering how DIT can, can support um, the UK DRI, so particularly the, the, the Department for International Trade. Yeah, so uh, Julie, I think this is, uh, you know, I highlighted a couple of our international um, uh, uh, collaborations. I think we, first of all, are very interested in reach. Uh, the, the problem of dementia is global. Uh, everyone is uh, trying variants of this same strategy. Um, it always has made sense for us to find ways of linking uh, risks in early development, uh, sharing risks in early development, um, uh, and also uh, making as transparent what early development outputs are to allow industries anywhere in the world to realize benefits from them. Now, um, I think one of the, the second things is that um, uh, the, uh, we need to find ways of projecting uh, the, the exciting work in the UK uh, more rapidly to an international audience to enable these contexts to be made. And so, so again, I, I think what I would encourage, Julie, I could, you could contact me afterwards or you could contact um, uh, um, Bart de Stroper or um, Adrian Ivinson, I-V-I-N-S-O-N, -S uh, both of whom can be reached through the UK DRI website uh, to find ways of linking in more formally. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, we have a question here from Sheikh Pim who says, deep brain stimulation seems like a positive way of treating dementias. How can you overcome contrary arguments that these technologies could lead to adverse control of the brain, as was briefly mentioned with moving the rat's whiskers uh, in your previous slides? Uh, that's a good question. So I think, let me divide that into two, uh, two aspects. The first is um, uh, the, the, the more direct one of, of simply having a therapeutic uh, approach that is associated with adverse, an adverse event. Um, so, like any ther uh, therapy in development, uh, these tools need to go through a careful uh, set of staged clinical trials, starting with small populations, moving to larger ones, always with close monitoring for both immediate and medium to longer term uh, adverse events. By identifying those, by trying to understand the mechanisms underlying them, uh, we can um, either uh, try to reduce their frequency or identify those uh, people who shouldn't be treated because of the risk that they might have. I think the second um, uh, approach to the question or the second side of the question is a purely ethical one. Um, what does it mean uh, to have 
the electrical signals in the brain, which fundamentally underpin uh, the way we think and feel, uh, manipulated by uh, an external tool. That's a debate for which there is just no simple answer. It's one that people, we need to uh, engage in uh, more and more aggressively. You saw the news probably about Elon Musk and uh, uh, developments in neurotechnology that they foresee in the commercial environment. We've got to race ahead of what might happen uh, uh, commercially to establish a framework by which this can be integrated uh, in a way that is acceptable across societies and that is able to change as society uh, values and norms uh, alter uh, from decade to decade. Yeah, ethics are hugely important for, for this area and all, all of neurotechnology. Um, we have a, a couple more questions about partnerships here. Um, so from Iman and Jim Ang, um, wondering about academic partnerships. So um, if you are outside of the, the six universities that are, in, are direct, directly involved in UK DRA, how can other academics get involved? So really important. First, let me say that uh, Giovanna Lali from the UK DRI has put in the chat uh, a link to um, uh, Kay Perricard's uh, email. Um, uh, so that uh, any industry partners who want to contact her can, can do so. I think um, what, is, uh, what is really different about the UK DRI as an, MR, as an institute is that it is explicitly outward facing. So it is not a group of academics who are retreating behind a wall of, of secure funding over decades. It is a group of academics who have a basis in funding and they're trying to engage external partners in the academic world as well. Um, uh, I think the, like any academic collaboration, the thing to do is to find the science that is relevant to you, uh, contact the individuals involved and see how uh, work can be initiated together. UKDRI is not a funding mechanism uh, for external parties, it, it really, but it is about leveraging external funding uh, between it is it is as interested in leveraging new external funding uh, with DRI members and external and members external to the DRI. Now, finally, I should say that the it, what is really important from an UKRI MRC perspective is to make absolutely clear that this is only part of the UK MRC or the NIHR's investment in dementia research. There is nothing about this that is exclusive. All, inst all the public institutions in the, U in the UK, uh, as well as the Wellcome Trust, openly welcome um, ideas uh, for new research from investigators all over the country, whether they're in the DRI or not. And there's a real, real importance in recognizing that this UK DRI investment has been over and above the usual MRC budgeting so it is an add-on. It's not detracting from the commitment of UKRI and MRC and other government agencies to fund um, research in dementia by those who are not in the DRI. Yeah, thank, thank you for clearing that. Um, we've just got time for one more question here. Really interesting question from uh, Lisa Harty from the, the Henry Royce Institute. Um, what are the main translational bottlenecks you have found to date taking academic discoveries into industry? Um, so Lisa, these are, this is a, a big set of questions <laughs> and I, let me try to pull out, I think one of the, one of, you know, two or three of the highlights is I see them having been someone who's worked on both sides. Uh, the first I think is, is lack of trust. Um, I think academics sometimes feel industry is trying to exploit them. Uh, industry feel, uh, may feel sometimes that it's hard to get academics to focus on what is needed for them or to under, uh, and, and to approach them in any other way as another funder. Uh, so trust needs to be developed. That's not something that happens overnight. Uh, the second thing is I think that objectives um, are often uh, ill-defined in starting partnerships. I think both partners need to come into um, uh, an arrangement making clear what it is that they need to get out of it and then uh, together defining on a, a set of um, uh, objectives that are achievable uh, and that can be tracked over time so both can see that their needs are being met. 
And finally, I think there is, um, um, uh, you know, I think universities uh, need to develop faster, sleeker ways of, um, uh, of developing contract mechanisms. Uh, industry does not want to exploit, uh, the, you know, they don't like legal messiness. Uh, they're perfectly willing to pay reasonable IP rates, but I think uh, they're, they're perfectly willing to recognize IP and to pay licensing fees. I think what universities need to do is recognize that they can't overvalue what they have at these very, very early discovery phases they, you know, their, um, their future, particularly with impact and ref, lies in showing how they can support industry, uh, just as industry uh, need, has a future that they need to find the innovation that lies in the public sector. Well, thank, thank you very much indeed, Paul. I think, unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time, but we'll, so we'll have to leave this, this section here. There are a mountain of questions that we can uh, try, and, try and discuss during the, the panel discussion later. Um, but Paul, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, Dr. Richard Perry from the Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. Um, Richard is a consultant urologist specializing in the early diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Um, he's now going to give us a clinician's uh, perspective. So, Richard, over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great for me to be able to participate in a forum like this, as um, I'm a neurologist who is fundamentally a clinician. And I've been working in memory clinics for about 25 years, and I've seen thousands of patients over that time. Um, thousands of patients thousands of families and often we can follow them up from the very earliest symptoms they present with right the way through the course of their condition um, and it's always important to remember that it's a, a real privilege to be able to work with these people who are in need uh, people with difficulties who come with needs and carry a large burden from this condition and one of the things that's become apparent through conversations over the years has been this um, slight gap between what's happening clinically with patients and trying to bridge that gap to all the uh, expertise and innovation in technology around. Um, and hopefully even a, a small movement like this can start to bridge that gap a little bit. So um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia are huge topics and it's not possible for me to cover the whole clinical aspects of these in 15 minutes so i'm just going to try and focus on some of the areas that are of importance to clinicians patients and their families as a starting point um, acknowledging the difference between um, dementia and alzheimer's disease Dementia itself is a clinical syndrome rather than a disease and to meet criteria for dementia people have to have progressive difficulties in two cognitive domains that affect their everyday activities. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. So dementia is an umbrella term of a syndrome, lots of different causes and diseases causing dementia. And Alzheimer's disease probably accounts for about 80% of the burden of dementia globally. It seems rather obvious to say it, but Alzheimer's disease is a progressive brain disease. Um, and I mention that because historically in the UK and worldwide, care and management of conditions like dementia and Alzheimer's disease have have to shift from it being seen as a normal part of aging um, and acknowledge that there, it is actually um, a progressive brain condition rather than a psychological consequence of aging. And certainly in the UK, we've lagged behind that transition. Um, a lot of UK services, clinical services, are aimed at making a dementia diagnosis. Um, and while that's important where dementia diagnosis rates are low, um, making a diagnosis between dementia and non-dementia doesn't really fundamentally address early and accurate diagnosis and looking towards treating the disease rather than just the care management side of things. So the pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease 
are buildup of abnormal proteins. And the two proteins that are most often discussed are amyloid protein and tau protein. There are other issues involved, inflammation, vascular change, oxidative stress, other organs in the body playing a role. But fundamentally what is causing the dementia is loss of neurons and loss of the synapses between neurons. Conditions like Alzheimer's disease, of course, don't occur overnight. The loss of function is one of the last things to happen in this cascade of events. So if we look at time moving along the bottom from somebody who's cognitively normal through a mild cognitive impairment stage to dementia, clinical function is only really deteriorating late in the condition. And while all our focus has been on diagnosis and care at this part of the spectrum of the disorder, in a way, this is end stage disease. More focus in the last few years has been on this stage, the mild cognitive impairment stage, which is a transition zone between cognitively normal and dementia, where people have cognitive impairment, but preserved activities of daily living. Part of the difficulty is there are a lot of people with cognitive impairment who meet criteria for MCI who don't progress to Alzheimer's disease or dementia because there are other causes of their cognitive impairment. Looking early, Earlier in the course of events, the changes in brain structure in terms of atrophy or loss of volume of the brain occur earlier. Changes in tau protein are probably occurring five, ten years prior to symptom onset and changes in amyloid deposition probably 10 or 15 years before um, symptom onset. For a clinician, there are always diagnostic issues. Diagnosing dementia in somebody with moderate disease is very straightforward clinically. It's a clinical syndrome based on a history and examination. Very few tests are required. In the way that we're trying to approach dementia and Alzheimer's disease in the last few years is to actually try and identify which people with symptoms are at the earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease. And then things get a little bit harder. We can use MRI scans to look for changes or shrinkage of parts of the brain, the hippocampi, and this coronal cut of an MRI scan. Or we can use PET scans, such as this amyloid PET scan showing amyloid buildup in the cortex of this patient. We can look at spinal fluid and look at change in proteins of spinal fluid. These are the kind of tools that we're currently using to pick up Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia in people with who are minimally symptomatic at the start of, the, of, of this process after clinical onset. If we could actually um, address these conditions and try and treat them early, prevent them either primary prevention or secondary prevention, the key in the future is going to be how to identify these people and these changes in a preclinical state before people have any symptoms and going through a cascade of changes from there being abnormal amyloid levels, abnormal amyloid levels that lead to neurodegeneration and buildup of tau, abnormal amyloid levels and neurodegeneration and the more subtle cognitive decline that can occur in those years, perhaps not noticed by people themselves very much, but perhaps recordable. Um, and this is where technology comes in, in terms of wearable devices um, and active and passive collection of data. Um, and I know Riona is going to talk more about this later. Alzheimer's disease doesn't come on all at once. There is a spectrum through um, the condition of different levels of problems. Although amyloid might build up many years before the onset of symptoms and tends to reach a plateau quite quickly with little change after the initial buildup of amyloid protein, tau protein builds up in defined areas of the brain, usually the entorhinal cortex, medial temporal lobe structures before the spread of tau in different parts of the brain. And this correlates better with um, neuronal loss, synaptic loss, and cognitive change. 
So while I don't want to say that there are only three stages of Alzheimer's disease, and many people um, quote seven stages, et cetera, the important thing is that the difficulties faced by people in the early stages are, difficult, are different from the difficulties faced by those in the late stages. And these early stage symptoms are really very, very difficult to distinguish from just normal aging, and normal everyday uh, memory loss. So what do patients want? When we see patients at the earliest stage of the condition, one of their key things is to maintain their independence. They want to maintain their social life, they want to travel alone, they want to manage their own finances, and they want to work. One huge thing that they really want and need is to be useful, to participate and to be of use. The loss of being useful and the loss of engagement and participation is a huge thing for people to transition through. And these areas where they want to maintain independence go right across what are called the activities of daily living. And that can be from very earliest stages from using computers, technology, mobile phones, to more advanced stages of the condition where people are having difficulty getting dressed, having difficulty with their everyday care, toileting, etc. One of the issues that we have to face is there's a difference between what patients are looking for and what those close to them are looking for. Sometimes people with these conditions don't have the levels of insight into their difficulties that others can see. And so one of the key concerns of families, as well as maintaining activities of daily living and independence, are the issues around safety. One of the areas that we've been focusing on clinically over the last few years is this phase of the condition called mild cognitive impairment. So mild cognitive impairment representing change in memory observed by others and measurable but with generally intact activities of daily living. While Alzheimer's disease is one of the most common causes of this, there are other causes of the same symptoms and in the elderly, depression, anxiety, sleep disturbance, medications, metabolic disturbance can all cause mild cognitive impairment. So how to differentiate those people whose mild cognitive impairment is due to the early stages of Alzheimer's disease or prodromal Alzheimer's disease, and whose mild cognitive impairment is due to another cause, is part of the focus of the diagnostic process early on. The kind of symptoms that people manifest with short-term memory loss tend to be things like forgetting appointments, forgetting details of conversations. They might be repetitive for questions and statements through the day, or they might have difficulty route finding. These have to be differentiated from the normal everyday um, lapses of concentration and memory that people worry about. So the typical examples that we would get is somebody um, saying, well, I go into a room and I forgot what I've gone in there for. That's not really a memory problem. That's a difficulty with attention and concentration. Because if they were going up the stairs to the room, they were daydreaming about something else, they find themselves in the room and it's what am I here for? So differentiating between Lapses of concentration and attention and real memory loss are one of those things that we're trying to look at in, in terms of um, imaging, in terms of neuropsychology, um, and in terms of differentiating which of those actually represents underlying brain change. Measuring the impact of memory loss on activities of daily living is not straightforward. Most activities of daily living scale are focusing on more advanced stages of the condition, tools looking at measuring activities of daily living for those people who are forgetful but otherwise intact and not well developed, and measuring the burden for people in society of these kind of memory difficulties is not an advanced process. Nevertheless, these symptoms have a significant impact on people's independence, their ability to do their everyday activities, to engage socially, to work and to be useful. One of the questions that comes up for us in a, a clinical situation is, can memory loss be treated? And as you 
are probably aware we have medications that are licensed for use in Alzheimer's disease. And their licensing is to help with memory and attention and concentration. And a lot of that um, background to that science comes from studies with mice and improving memory performance in mice. But on a clinical basis, we don't actually see that the drugs help people's memory. People who are forgetful remain forgetful. What they help with is attention and concentration through modulating acetylcholine. In terms of making forgetful people not forgetful, we haven't seen effective medications. And certainly in terms of development of medications, most of the symptomatic drugs are about behavior and attention and concentration, or they're about developers, developing disease modifying agents to change the buildup of tau or amyloid proteins. Pharmaceuticals developed to help with memory, I think at a very sort of early stage. Um, and it's something that it would be good to see development in this area, if possible. Um, it's an open question for me, but I'm not sure that drugs are the way forward for memory loss. Um, I'd like to be convinced otherwise. People look at training and exercises to help with memory. In the same way, these kind of approaches will help with the attentional muscle of the brain, but won't necessarily make somebody who's forgetful not forgetful. We can support memory, reminders, diaries, prompts, um, new technology in the home, etc. So assist, assistive technology has a role to play. And of course, as Paul was discussing earlier, forms of brain stimulation may be a great way forward whether that's transcranial magnetic stimulation or non-invasive deep brain stimulation. So the area of memory loss is likely to be um, a key area in the years ahead, particularly if we start to see disease modifying agents come online. If we see disease modifying agents come online, there'll be more people at a memory loss stage of the disease for longer. And I think this is a sort of key therapeutic area. So from a clinician's perspective, um, we always recognize that there are other forms of dementias and we see a lot of people with frontotemporal dementia and Lewy body disease. But Alzheimer's disease really does account for the majority of the burden in dementia. Um, there's a continuum of impairments, right from the mildest memory loss through to needing full-time full, full care. Um, Every patient's different, every patient's situation is different and often dependent on the care network around them. Uh, and so the, the, there's a broad um, range of targets to help people in this area. What our patients are really looking for is they want to main, maintain their independence. They want to be useful and they want to participate. Because of issues about insight, safety is more of a concern for carers and other services. The technology applications in this area seem to be broad, all the way from diagnostics, novel treatment modalities, safety and monitoring. And we'll hear a bit more about that later this morning. At the moment, my feeling is that we've got minimal benefit from current approaches to memory loss. And that's an area that I'm particularly interested to see uh, technological approaches to. So I'm going to leave it at that point there, um, and we can uh, take any questions that have come up. Thank you very much, Richard. That was really, really interesting. Um, we've got quite a few questions here, but I think we'll just have time for one or two of these. Um, Andrew Ruck asks, can you comment on the NHS CCG willingness or otherwise to commission digital technology-based services to address mild co cognitive impairment or slow progression uh, to AD? Well, in the same way that there's a, a disconnect between clinicians and those innovating technology, there's often a disconnect between clinicians and CCGs. Um, we've been running our service here for you know, 15 or 20 years. We've had no interest from CCGs at all in developing our services. We tend to specialize in younger persons with dementia. Um, and using more advanced diagnostic te techniques to get earlier and more accurate diagnosis. So the CCG's um, 
I suspect are battling to address the backlog in terms of dementia diagnosis rates. The starting point that they're at um, is a difficult one. Um, they've got a lot of catching up to do just to bring basic levels of diagnosis and care up to speed. Um, and I suspect that's some of the reason why um, they don't really have the capacity to take on innovations in the way that a lot of the rest of us would like. Um, apart from that, I haven't had any experience of actually discussing with CCGs. I'm afraid I tend to be based in my clinic room with patients. Yeah. Um, we've got a, a question here from a researcher at Nottingham Trent University who is asking, um, what's your feeling about plaque destruction by ultrasound from um, outside the skull? Um, great if it would work. Um, haven't seen the evidence that it would work. I think the, um, th these processes take a, a long time, don't they? If we look at um, amyloid lowering medications, um, they've been through 15, 20 years of development. Um, yes, we're starting to see that they remove amyloid plaque. Have we yet um, been convinced that they affect people in terms of their activities of daily living and cognitive change? Well, you know, that remains an open question. So um, I think that's still quite a long way from a, a, a clinical application. But um, how do these technologies find a place in development? Um, how do they find a place in the development next to pharmaceutical research, um, which tend to be the big players? Um, they tend to be you know, global initiatives, um, studies that take place in many countries around the world, multiple sites, um, really large ventures. So how do you get um, something new like this into a situation where, where you can actually um, expand it out and compete in that market with pharmaceutical research? Yeah. Right, I'm just conscious of time, so we'll, we'll just have to leave uh, this Q&A section uh, there for now. But Richard, thank you very much indeed. That was, that was really, really interesting. Um, I'd now like to, to bring in uh, Dr. Riona McArdle. Um, Riona is a research associate at the Translational and Clinical Research Institute at Newcastle University in the Brain and Movement Research Group. Um, Riona is going to be discussing wearable technology as a clinical tool for uh, dementia. So Riona, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen okay here. So thank you very much for asking me to come and speak to you today. I'm going to talk to you about a piece of work that I did looking at the application of wearable technology in different types of dementia. And specifically what I'm going to talk about today is the use of accelerometers for gait analysis. So the data that I'm going to talk about today comes from the Gate Dem project. And this is a project that I carried out as part of my PhD at Newcastle University, supervised by Professor Lynn Rochester, Professor Alan Thomas and Dr. Brooke Galna. So today I just want to tell you a little bit about why we might want to analyse gait in different types of dementia and give you some of the preliminary findings that we found with wearable technology, as well as some insight into the challenges that we still face as we try to take this technology into clinical practice. So first of all, let's talk about gait. Why are we so interested in gait? Well, gait simply refers to the way that we walk. And although we often think that that's simple and automatic, we now know it actually requires complex cognitive processes and can be very sensitive to changes in our brain. For example, our gait begins to slow down up to 12 years prior to our diagnosis of dementia, which indicates that it's an early risk factor or an early red flag for knowing that someone will go on to develop dementia. There's many different characteristics of gait that we can look at in research, but for today, I'm just going to focus on 14 characteristics of gait that I use within my research and that we can derive from the accelerometer. And this means that it remains consistent with the body of work from the rest of my lab group. So these 14 characteristics of gait have been grouped into four domains, and that's loosely based on a model of gait that has been validated in older adults and in Parkinson's disease. We look at aspects of pace, such as how fast or slow a person walks or how long their steps are. We look at a domain called rhythm, which refers to the timing of gait. So how long does it take for you to make a step? How long do you spend with both of your feet on the ground or with one foot off the ground? 
And we also look at variability of gait, which is how much we change our footsteps as we're walking. So for example, are you changing your step length a lot or are you changing your step time a lot? Finally, we look at asymmetry of gait, how different our left and right footsteps look from each other. So for example, again, is your step length on your left side quite different to the step length on your right side? Why might we look at these gait characteristics in dementia? Well, assessment of gait has many clinically meaningful results, such as the prediction or discrimination of neurological diseases, the ability to monitor progression of both gait and cognitive impairments and to reflect cognitive impairments, the ability to identify falls risk, and the ability to assess the efficacy of drug treatments or of interventions that we employ in neurological diseases. So there is quite a lot of interest in why we would look at gait in populations such as dementia. But dementia is not one size fits all. So there's many different types of dementia as we've already talked about. And today I'm going to talk about two of the most common neurodegenerative types of dementia. And that's Alzheimer's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. Now in Alzheimer's disease, they have a prominent memory impairment right in the early stages of it. However, in dementia with Lewy bodies, they have four core symptoms that they may experience. So that might be attentional fluctuations, visual hallucinations, REM sleep behavior disorder, where they would have active dreams that they might act out, or Parkinsonism. So on paper, that sounds like it would be really easy to spot the differences between them. But in practice, it's not really like that, especially in the early stages. Many of the symptoms that people with dementia with Lewy bodies have may not be experienced within the clinic and we're relying on self-report because they're not observable. And as a result of this, dementia with Lewy bodies often goes underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's disease. And that affects how we manage and treat the disease. But GAIT might be a useful diagnostic tool to support accurate diagnosis between the subtypes. So I published a paper in 2019 that showed that if we assess people with different types of dementia using goal standard gait analysis techniques, such as an instrumented walkway, we can see unique signatures of gait impairments between people with Alzheimer's and Lewy body dementias. For example, people with Lewy body dementias were more variable when they walk, so they changed their steps a lot more. And they're also more asymmetric when they walk, so their left and right footsteps look quite different from Alzheimer's. So this suggested that GATE may be a useful tool to help aid diagnosis um, during a clinician's diagnostic tests. But a well-equipped GATE lab, like what we can use in research, would be too costly to have in a normal clinic. And so we needed to find a cheaper solution. Our lab group and many other lab groups around the world have been working very hard to validate algorithms which can detect GATE characteristics, such as the ones that I spoke about earlier and use them to drive information about a person's walking using small wearable devices. So you can see the device that I'm talking about today. It's a small triaxial accelerometer and we place it on a person's lower back. In the initial stages of the, of the evidence I'm going to show, we did this at the same time as the gold standard gait assessment. So we asked people to walk up and down a lab, a 10 meter walkway, six times at their comfortable pace, not doing any other tasks. I recruited 125 people to this study, but for the purposes of today, I'm going to present 85 people for the analysis. This included 25 controls, 32 people with Alzheimer's, and 28 people with dementia with Lewy bodies. These participants ranged from mild cognitive impairment to moderate dementia, but were predominantly in the milder stages of the disease, and we verified that with the clinician's um, consensus diagnostics. There was no significant differences for age, height, or BMI between any of these groups. <clears throat> from the accelerometer, I received a signal like you can see on the screen. And from this, I could derive the different characteristics of gait that I previously told you I was interested in. So the question was, using wearable technology in the lab, could we spot unique signatures of gait impairments between different dementia subtypes and also, could we spot different gait patterns between dementia subtypes and people who are having normal aging, so our control group? I've displayed my results using this radar plot, so I'll talk you through this. This black line is our controls, and I've used zero scores for the controls and Z scores to illustrate the difference between the dementia disease groups and the controls. So we can see the difference between the controls and Alzheimer's with this red line, and we can see that the blue line is dementia with Lewy bodies. 
So first of all, we found that we could differentiate dementia with Lewy bodies from Alzheimer's because they had a more variable step length. So they're changing their step lengths a lot more in comparison to Alzheimer's. We also found we could differentiate both dementia subtypes from controls because they have shorter steps. They have more variability as they're walking. They spend more time with both of their feet on the ground. And they also spend, they're also more asymmetric when they're walking. Additionally, we could see that people with dementia with Lewy bodies walked slower in comparison to controls. So this shows potential for gait analysis in the lab as a useful tool for discriminating dementia subtypes from each other and from normal aging. However, the lab may not be the most realistic picture of gait, and there is growing speculation that looking at gait in the real world might be more sensitive to disease-specific signatures of gait impairment due to the complexity and challenges of the environment. While gait in the lab usually involves walking in a straight line at a consistent pace, real-world gait involves manoeuvring around different terrains, changing your gait to your differing environments, taking turns. So when we measure gait in the clinical lab, this really only gives us a snapshot of a person's performance capacity, as in what they could do in the best possible circumstances, as opposed to a continuous picture of true function, as in what they actually do. So I wanted to find out if gait in the lab or the real world could provide similar outcomes, and if the real world perhaps exaggerated gait impairments, making it easier to find these differences. So I use the same wearable technology to do this. I place the same body-worn monitor on a person's lower back, but this time I asked them to wear it continuously for seven days, even at night, even in the shower. And from this, I could derive the exact same gait outcomes, and I could question if a person's natural everyday walk might be a better indicator of cognitive impairment and dementia disease subtype. So what did I find this time? So again, I'm using these radar plots to illustrate my results. The black line is controls, the red line is Alzheimer's disease, and the blue line is dementia with Lewy bodies. And this time we found no differences between dementia with Lewy bodies and Alzheimer's, which is quite surprising. And we found that only dementia with Lewy bodies could be differentiated from controls because they walked slower, they had shorter steps, and they were more variable. So there was no differences between Alzheimer's and controls either. So we did find that wearable technology in the lab demonstrates differences between dementia disease subtypes and between dementia and normal aging, but we didn't find any of these differences in the real world. So why is that happening? Well, it might be because of how those differing strategies and environments affect gait. So in the lab, participants are asked to perform um, a gait task and often they improve their ability in comparison to what we would see in the real world because they know that we're watching them. So they've got a performance bias. All participants are therefore performing much better than what we would see in the real world. And this shows the differences between their performance capacity and true function. And we've seen in Parkinson's disease that you could get someone to do the exact same test in their own home compared to in the lab and they would perform much worse in the real world as in comparison to the lab. So perhaps people with Alzheimer's and controls are both getting worse than their gait and that's why we're not seeing the differences. Additionally, when a person is walking in a lab, it's a very controlled environment. So we can be very confident that when we see gait impairments, these might be disease specific. When they're walking in the real world, they're walking under lots of different kinds of conditions. And because the wearables are unobtrusive, we don't know where people are walking, so we don't understand how these conditions are affecting the data that we're collecting. So we can sort of look at context by examining signatures of gait impairment when people are walking in different walking bout lengths, so just the period of time that they're walking in. So for example, we might assume that if a person is taking over 60 seconds of continuous walking, they're probably outside or in their community environments, while if they're taking only, say, under 10 seconds of continuous walking, they might just be moving around the room, going to the fridge, picking up something, um, and so on. So they're quite different types of walking that a person would engage in. So I had a look at this within the data and I found that shorter bout lengths actually were more useful for distinguishing Alzheimer's and dementia with Lewy bodies. So if we look again at the red line and the blue line in these graphs, we can see that they seem to have quite a different pattern of gait, particularly in step length. People with dementia with Lewy bodies have much shorter steps than these walking bout lengths. And they're also much more symmetric in these walking bout lengths, which I speculate is to do with their turning behaviors.
However, when we look at these longer walking bout lengths, so for example, over 60 seconds or 30 to 60 seconds, they seem to have a very similar pattern of behavior and it makes it much harder to distinguish them. So these may not be walking bout lengths that would be useful to use. So what we see from these findings is that it is possible the context in which a person is walking in can impact their patterns of gait impairments. And it might be this added environmental complexity of the real world that makes it difficult to discern unique signatures of gait impairment between different pathologies. The real world settings that people experience are not necessarily the same. So you can imagine one person might be walking in a very spacious and neat and tidy house, while a person, another person may be in a very cluttered house that requires a lot more turning. And this would give us very different patterns of walking um, and makes it much harder for us to interpret our results. It's important to acknowledge such limitations when we're choosing which method of gait analysis to use because lab-based and real-world gait may be better suited to different purposes. For example, lab-based gait might be best applied to looking at between group differences, such as trying to discriminate between different dementia subtypes, while real-world gait may be more useful to monitor within-person changes. So is their disease progressing? Is their medication working? Can we see that? This is not to say real world gait should not be assessed because it does have the potential to decrease numbers of outpatient visits and reduce healthcare costs, provide objective evidence to tailor and assess therapies and interventions, and improve how we deliver high quality medicine and precision medicine. So to end this talk, I'm just going to quickly summarize two of the key challenges that we need to prioritize to address as we move forward with gait analysis as a clinical tool for diagnosis and disease management. The first thing we need to do is update the algorithms that we use in wearable technology. The algorithms that we're using in the real world have actually been designed and validated in indoor settings. So these make a number of assumptions about the type of terrain a person is walking across, what location the sensor is on, and they don't really account for changes in the environment like cracked pavements or different weather conditions or changes in gait speed as a person is moving through different kinds of environments like crowds. The unobtrusive nature of wearable devices also means that in these early stages of the research, we don't really understand why gait impairments are occurring in different contexts. So we might want to gain a better view of this by validating it using, say, wearable technology or companion applications such as GPS or by assessing the walkability of a participant's environment. Additionally, there's yet to be any consensus on what is the best metric to describe gait in the real world. So there is a wealth of alternative features of gait analysis that I haven't spoken about today. And there's also emerging characteristics as gyroscopes become more common in wearable technology. And that makes it really hard for us to pinpoint what is the most relevant characteristic? What do we need to assess? In order to, to answer these questions, we really need to take a collaborative approach. We need to move across, we need to move past small isolated pilot studies, such as the one I've done and try to accumulate and condense data from many different studies in many different conditions, select target characteristics, and encourage best practice standards when we're thinking about the application and analysis of gate data from wearable technology. These collaborations should also engage with clinicians, patients, and regulatory bodies to make sure that we are actually being effective, that the results are clinically relevant, easy to use, and contribute to clinical decisions in a meaningful way beyond what is already out there. So these efforts are underway, but there is still um, significant limitations. So just to sum up, this study did demonstrate that gait analysis is useful in the lab environment using wearable technology. However, we still have a lot to understand about how gait works in the real world when we're assessing wearable technology. More work needs to be done to the wearables in order for us to understand this. So, for example, we need to better understand the impact of environment and context. We need to improve the algorithms that we're using and we need to take collaborative approaches to encourage best practice standards. Before I go, I just want to quickly acknowledge my supervisory team and the Brain and Movement Research Group, which I work within, our funding bodies, the Alzheimer's Society and the Biomedical Research Centre, and of course, the um, wonderful participants that took part in this study. I'm happy to take any questions and you can also reach out to me via email or Twitter. Thanks, Rihanna. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I've, I've just got a question. Are phone, mobile phones, do they have enough accelerate, accelerometer technology in them to, to do this in general public? 
Um, yes, I do. So there is people that are looking at that. The reason that we aren't specifically looking at it as a clinical tool, and I think the caveat to it, is we don't know who has the mobile phone. So someone else could pick it up and move around and we can find an anomaly. Um, we don't know where it's located. Like, for example, men might have place it in their pocket, but a woman is probably going to put it in, a tam in their handbag and that's not going to give us a gate signal. So they're a lot harder to interpret the data in terms of knowing with absolute accuracy what we're finding. Yeah, okay. Um, we have a question here from Taylor Shakespeare. How are gate signatures translated into radar plots to, to determine the walking behavior of people with dementias, i.e. what computational tools might be used to translate this data? I'm, I'm not quite sure what that means, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, do you mean using the radar plots? We just take raw data and I turn it into the radar plot so that I can look at it. But we have raw data as in um, how many milliseconds it takes to walk a certain amount of distance for our gait speed um, or our SD for our gait variability. So it's just, we just take raw data. And there's many different gait characteristics as well. It's not just these 14. Um, People in my lab have recently created a paper or written a paper and published a paper that has, I think, like 250 gate characteristics that you could derive. So you can pick and choose what you want. It just depends on what your research question is. We've got a question here from Mike Handley um, asking, what other wearables have you thought about using to cross-reference? So there is a big study going on at the moment. Um, it's an IMI consortium called Mobilize D, and they are cross-referencing using... Um, like inbuilt, inbuilt sensors into shoes so that they can pick up um, and validate the step length and step time, for example. Um, I think that they're also using GPS as well to make sure that you can understand where the context is. Um, additionally, we use IMU devices with gyroscopes in them. And in the lab, we can place them on a person's head um, on their wrist, around their belt, like a belt around their waist and on their ankles, which also helps us validate, but I don't necessarily think that would be the best for putting on a person to send them out in the world. Um, so there's a lot of different wearables that we've used to cross validate and we're also trying to find out if our wearable that we use currently would be useful at detecting say sleep or fatigue as well um, so that we can get a more full battery of characteristics that a clinician could use. We've also got a question here from Mike Harris. What computer vision technology have you used? Are you aware of uh, any to analyze movement? So we don't use any particular um, vision technology. We have an in-house um, processing system that we use using um, a cloud-based platform called ePrime or eScience. Um, and so we just compute the raw signal and turn it into the raw data, data output, really. We haven't used any data visualization techniques. I know that our um, boss, Lynn Rochester, is looking for someone who can help with the data techniques or the data visualization, as that's quite important for us to be able to translate it clinically. Yeah, brilliant. So Mike, do get in touch if, if that's your, your area. Um, I've got one more question here. Are the gate metrics correlated with any other behavioral or cognitive uh, symptoms, e.g. spatial disorientation in uh, Alzheimer's patients? Yes, they are. That was a good part of my PhD, actually, was looking at the um, relationship between discrete cognitive domains and um, discrete gait characteristics. So particularly in Lewy body disease, I found that gait variability was associated with executive function and attention. So the more attentional and executive dysfunction a person has, the greater variability they had. And we need to do more validation to find out what that means inside the brain. We need to look at neuroimaging results, but there is very good evidence out there that shows that attention and executive function in particular are very important to managing our gait. Um, there is a little bit of speculation about memory and some of the timing characteristics of gait as well, but I haven't seen that revalidated and I didn't find it in, in my work. Um, it's also, gait is obviously also correlated with motor problems if someone's got a motor problem um, and also activities of daily living. So the more problems people have with their activities of daily living, the um, more gait impairments they usually also have. Well, oh, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Riona. Um, we'll have to, to leave the Q&A uh, there for now, um, but thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Brian Murphy, who is the Chief Scientific Officer at Brainwave Bank, who are based in, in Northern Ireland. Brian is a computational neuroscientist and is an expert in brain reading technology. He's also an assistant professor at, in data science at Queen's University, Belfast, 
and he's going to be discussing in-home measurement of cognitive performance in healthy aging. So, Brian. Um, so yeah, we want to make it possible to measure neurocognitive function on a larger scale and more objectively than has been possible before. And I have to say, first of all, this kind of grew out of my uh, academic background. So I start, came out of an engineering degree, worked in the web industry for a, a couple of years in China and Germany, and then went back to study cognitive science, did a PhD in that in Trinity in Dublin, then went and did a, a long postdoc in cognitive neuroscience and neuroimaging in Italy, and then went to the machine learning department in Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, we're working also on the uh, cognitive neuroscience of language from a data-driven perspective. And then finally, I was a, a lecturer in Queen's University, Belfast. I'm not actually there anymore. I am a, a visiting researcher, but um, I'm now full-time with the company. And I personally found it frustrating to be writing a paper about the, the nature of the way you know, meaning is represented in one or other language. Um, and trying to make these grand uh, you know, claims about human nature and the mind and the brain based on 45 minutes of time in the scanner from eight people for example and they were usually postdocs and we're all aware of the issues of the populations that we tend to uh, record and, and study are often biased they may be more white more educated more uh, concentrated industrial countries and things like that and uh, it was i found it then frustrating seeing that we've got very interesting big data and machine learning techniques but we really don't have this, the, the the quantity of evidence that makes those uh, techniques really show their um their promise and um, let's see if this goes on. Yeah, okay. Um, so we have been around as a company, kind of founded, com coming out of that motivation since 2015, really got running in 2016. There are 20 of us. Um, there are eight PhDs at the company, so we're a very science-based company, and they range from people who are experiencing clinical trials, who are cognitive neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, biomedical engineers, data analysis people. And we are funding funded by a mix of uh, equity and grants, uh, about, I'd say, kind of between a third and a quarter of our uh, funding to date has come from uh, mostly government funding, uh, mostly the UK government, IUK, and then different uh, tax and business incentives, which have been very helpful and also through a lot of uh, collaborative work with universities. Um, now, we see challenges in CNS orders generally in the measurement uh, of the disease being there in the first place and then tracking its progression. And that has implications for uh, clinical uh, use cases where you want to catch the disease early and give people uh, the uh, the therapy or the help or the assistance that they need uh, in a timely manner and also the correct one that you can uh, tell the difference between different underlying pathologies and also uh, in terms of development of new therapies because we know in Alzheimer's disease there aren't really very many very effective therapies. Now just looking at uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia in the context of natural aging we know already that uh, certain cognitive functions, certain crystallized cognitive functions actually improve with age. You know, we increase our vocabulary, our world knowledge, for example, but many of the other cognitive functions, the sorts of things we measure in cognitive neuroscience and cognitive psychology, flu so-called fluid intelligence decline with age. And that's to be expected. And we do also know that for people who are likely in the future to develop Alzheimer's disease dementia, the uh, you may expect to see an early slight decline in memory performance uh, relative to other cognitive functions. So you see a bit of a gap between uh, other fluid, uh, uh, fluid intelligence functions and memory. And that's called amnestic mild cognitive impairment, AMCI, which was uh, you know, mentioned earlier in, in the talks. And then as people hit dementia, then you would see a general fall off in uh, function globally. And this can often be quite dramatic in its speed as well. I mean, this is a cartoon based on on some of the, the original slide based on and Park et al, but the rest is a cartoon. But I think it's a there's a there's a broad consensus that something like this is happening. Um, now the reasons for that are several. You've also seen a version of this slide before. We know that there is pathology starting many, many years before anything is visible. Finally, in terms of clinical function. So the far right here is clinical function, meaning, meaning the activities of daily living. These are things that matter to sufferers, the fact that they can't find their keys, that they aren't allowed to drive anymore, that ultimately uh, you know, a court may mandate that they're not allowed to have uh, financial, uh, take, have control of their financial uh, affairs anymore. Um, but these then are earlier than that, usually driven by cognition, changes in cognition. And I think one nice way to think about that is like the middleware, it's the mediating functions or, or, or uh, computational or uh, cognitive capacities that are between the neurobiological pathology and the actual effect on your day-to-day -day, uh, quality of life. 
Now, you would think based on uh, what we know about the, uh, the, the accumulation of amyloid beta, uh, synaptic dysfunction, tau mediated neuronal injury, you would think that cognition would be, changes in cognition would be visible earlier. So if your neural substrate is becoming damaged, it's surprising that it has no effect on your cognition, which is a, a, a behavioral expression of your brain function and your brain, brain structure. And the reasons usually cited for this is one is that the tools we have to measure cognition are maybe not as sensitive as we would like them to be. Um, they may, there may be problems with the tools themselves, the way they're used. Another very uh, common uh, explanation, uh, I think it's in many ways supported by evidence, but I think also uh, a lot of people just think it's common sense, but it hasn't been tested well enough, is day-to-day -day variation. So we know that depending on mood, sleep, caffeine intake, how you're feeling that day, etc., you may perform better or worse on one day or another. We know there's a lot of day-to-day -day variation in real-world life. Um, another reason that may that there may be for this gap between where we see change in, in the brain and see change in cognition is compensatory strategies. So we know that the brain is very adaptive. So even in healthy people, for example, the left-hand side of the brain is more specialized for language, but in certain high cognitive load situations, certain parts of the right-hand brain can't, right-hand side of the brain can be uh, recruited to assist, um, which would not normally be uh, language specialized. And similarly, in uh, cases where there's uh, damage to the brain or the brain uh, structure is compromised, you can see that it's believed, and this is mostly theory, in, in, and it's called cognitive reserve, that the, the brain is using other parts of the brain to uh, compensate for the damaged parts of the brain, for example, already damaged the hippocampus. And at least neuroimaging, functional neuroimaging of various kinds has at least the capacity or the, the possibility to measure the fact that the brain is finding workarounds or working harder to uh, maintain the same external behavioral performance before it becomes overwhelmed at some stage and then you fall off that cliff, as I kind of showed on the previous slide. Now, the um, question is, what tools do we have today? And they usually fall into two, uh, two um, classes. One is we've either got neuroimaging, functional neuroimaging, or structural neuroimaging. We've got different analysis of people's blood plasma or their spinal fluid. And these are things that can only be done in hospitals. And they're also things that are not necessarily that close to the brain um, or brain to function. So for example, plasma analysis will try and uh, guess or kind of extrapolate what your brain concentration of certain uh, proteins is based on what you see in the blood. Um, and to be, there's, there's certainly some recent really amazing uh, advances in this, but it is a, a surrogate. It's kind of one, a few steps away from the actual cognitive function that we're interested in. Um, another issue about this is it's not necessarily something which is available to the whole world. It's expensive and even things like PET are in fact not widely used even in Western Europe. It's really only North America where it's been used more widely as a clinical tool. It's never going to be there for the tens and hundreds of millions of people who would be affected by dementia in countries like uh, Turkey, Brazil, India, China, Indonesia. The other things we have are things which are very easy to use and cheap and scalable, um, but they're not necessarily as objective if they're further away from the brain. And what we'd really like to have is something up in this top right quadrant. You'd like to have something that has the direct object objective measurement qualities, but also is, is scalable and usable. And we've developed a suite of tools to allow us to do that. It's, uh, this is field tested, as I'll show you in a minute. Um, and uh, what it consists of is a, a dry EEG headset, uh, which is the only neuroimaging technology which today can be used on a large scale and uh, in the wild and is relatively affordable and easy to use. And um, that may change in the future, uh, maybe 10 years from now, there are some really interesting technologies coming down the road. Um, but right now it's what we have. We've also got gamified co cognitive assessments. So we do want to be able to assess discrete cognitive functions. Like, you know, for example, particular varieties of memory may be impaired earlier. We'd like to measure that specifically. But if you ask people to do standard lab tests day after day after day, they'll stop because the lab tasks are really, really dull and are not uh, designed to be repeated and are not designed to be engaging in the long term. So we take lab science, lab cognitive neuroscience, and hide those mechanisms inside things that feel like little games. And this is all then done in the context of people being able to do this in the home or in the clinic, and that data then being collect, re, collected remotely, um, monitored remotely, and automatically pre-processed so we can make sense of that data. Just so you get a feel for this, I'm going to play a short video which I'll just talk over. Um, 
what we have is a headset which uh, is made of soft materials using soft dry EEG sensors which penetrate the hair and are also safe because they're soft and uh, people can put this headset on usually within about th once they're practiced within about three minutes it also has certain physical features to make it easy to put it in a consistent position which is important for the sensor readouts being uh, uh, replicable sorry comparable across different sessions and different individuals and uh, we walk people through getting it on getting good contact to the scalp to get good signal quality and then after that we ask people a series of lifestyle related questions uh, like uh, what's your caffeine intake today for instance uh, followed by a very fixed and a carefully designed and controlled protocol of certain tasks which can t test different tasks on different days um, so and that is all part of the platform so we have the headset and the tablet feeding data into our uh, into our cloud infrastructure, which does automatic pre-processing quality assurance and quality assessment of the data. And then we can deliver that back down to our partners, whether they're farmer partners or academic scientists for analysis, while also giving people during the trial the ability to see the results of, a, of an at-home session within about three minutes of the session finishing and make sure that people are using the equipment correctly and are getting real usable EEG data. And we also have the capacity that we've proven, for example, with fitness trackers, that you can take in other data streams in parallel and analyze them. Um, as I said, it's been used in quite a few studies. Um, over 250,000 people have used it over days and weeks in the home. And this has been done with universities, with pharma companies. Um, I'll probably just, I want to do this quickly because I know our time is limited. I'll just run you, run you through two of the studies we've run just to give you a sense of the kind of usability and the data quality we get. So the first study we ran, this was supported by Innovate uh, UK and it was done with Queen's University Belfast. And we asked uh, 90 older adults, all healthy, age 40 to 80, to use this platform for 25 minutes, okay, let's call it 30 minutes a day, five days a week for 12 weeks, for three months, uh, for no good reason at all. You know, these people are getting no benefit from this. They don't have a, any condition. It's purely for research purposes. And we were, they were doing it out of the goodness of their heart. There was no compensation uh, for their, their compliance. And I have to say, when we designed the study, I fully expected people to stop doing it quite soon. So we, we wanted to ask them to do something unreasonable to see when they stopped, you know, how far we could push it. I was very pleasantly surprised to see that people did continue using it through the 12 weeks. So this shows that, for example, in the 12th week of use, on average, people were get, submitting something like four and a half sessions per week out of the requested five. And this is, in fact, for people over 65. So uh, it's clear to us that there certainly aren't major technology barriers. This was in, in, cited in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Major technology uh, barriers to older people using this, or also not uh, you know, manual dexterity, for example. There's also the question of signal reliability. So on this first study, we found on an average session, 14 or 15 out of 16 sensors were working. That's in fact improved quite a lot since then. Um, there are certain issues with certain parts of the head being more variable in shape and size uh, here at the crown, but that's something we're working on with the new version of our headset. And as I say, recent studies do a lot better. Um, and then in terms of the sort of data we can get out, um, we do like to get the behavior. So you can see somebody's accuracy and reaction time on a task, on a specific task, which taps a particular part of cognitive function but then also see the underlying brain activity and you can see here grand average ERPs so this is a time locked uh, brain activity average signature in response to a game in uh, from half a second before a particular event until one second after that's what the time time scale here at the bottom says and this is specifically here people were watching these spaceships move around the screen one space would become bigger than open up and they would see either an alien which they're meant to shoot or an astronaut which they were not meant to shoot and uh, you can see here uh, this zero is when the spaceship would open and for those of you who know EEG we see the sort of characteristic features we would see you can see a long prep preparatory activity here the readiness potential before the, the, the spaceship op opens we see in the first two two to three tenths of a second the visual activity the visual processing and then here after the kind of three tenths of a second after the, the spaceship has opened you see the decision making and working memory effort to decide do i shoot or do i not shoot and we also saw not only do we see that we see age-related differences that the literature led us in advance to expect were there, that you see a difference in speed and latency that the younger people or the middle-aged people relative to the older people are doing quicker visual processing, but they're also more efficiently uh, making the decisions.
not that there was very little difference in their performance. In this case, pretty much everyone got it right pretty much all the time. But you can see already under underneath that hood, underneath the hood, you can see already differences in the neural activity. One more study I'll just very quickly run through is one that we did in collaboration with a research university clinical academic in Germany and also with one of the pharma companies with Takeda. And here we're trying to prove that we could detect pharmacological function. So we had a very nice design, 30 adult males, uh, double crossover design uh, with a uh, racemic ketamine, which is the same uh, infusion procedure used for off-label treatment of treatment resistant depression, primarily in the United States, but it's also of interest to a lot of pharma companies. And uh, we found both during infusion of ketamine uh, that we saw the expected changes to resting state EEG. So you could record kind of just kind of the idling of the brain while you're not doing anything, just sitting back and relaxing with your eyes closed. This is uh, predicted both by animal work, so rats, primates, and also in humans. And then we also saw, and this is something totally new, this was first just confirming things that you should see, you expect to see already, completely new. We saw a week after people had been uh, infused with ketamine, we saw changes in their brain activity which uh, in this game, in the P300 game, the, uh, astro the yeah, decision-making game. And this is uh, at least consistent with some of the accounts of how ketamine works, that it induces a neuroplastic, neuroplastic state in which uh, a beneficial change, can, therapeutic change can take place in people who you know, have done uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, for instance, before, but haven't felt, have felt overwhelmed or don't have the resources to be able to enact that. And this gives them that that uh, capability. And uh, that's more or less it. I've just got some uh, publications, of course, be very, very happy to hear from anyone afterwards who would like to read any of our publications that we have, uh, mostly posters at the big Alzheimer's conferences. And uh, we're also always very interested to talk to different academic groups who have uh, a question they'd like to answer on a larger scale outside the lab with objective uh, measures of brain activity. Um, for example, with a joint grant uh, submission or something like that, or if you've got cohorts already that you'd like to study. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Brian. That was really, really interesting. Um, you mentioned that you've, you've got a mix of grant funding in and VC investment. How did you find the journey of getting VC investment for, for very early stage research? Um, yes, so it is, uh, it is challenging because when you come out of a university, uh, with the technology like this, um, and you're basing it on your own work, but also on the ex existing uh, literature. Um, and even somebody like me who has already worked in a couple of startups, you know, I had a startup, a fintech startup before I did my PhD. Um, uh, not that successful one, as you can tell, because I ended the PhD, but um, the a lot of VCs will kind of look, uh, venture capitalists will look kind of askew at it. They'll think, well, you know, who am I? Uh, you know, I'm not qualified to evaluate whether it's any good. And uh, that's where funding from the government agencies like uh, IUK, Innovate UK, is really, really important because they're both, they they share the risk with the VCs. So they say, we're going to pay X percent, often 70% of this sort of early research and development work. And they also, for the VCs or your angel investors, it could also be just somebody with, with money who say got a passion for helping an Alzheimer's but doesn't feel at all qualified to evaluate your technology. Uh, for them, it's also an endorsement. They think, okay, if Innovate UK with all their experts thinks it's, it's worth them putting money into, it must be good, it must be worthwhile. Um, so that's been extremely important. Then as you move up the, the chain, as you, you, you get more evidence uh, that what you're doing actually works, which of course it may or may not work. That's the, 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 the reality of early stage technological companies and scientific companies. Uh, then the VCs are, are more open to it. And then you can get up to say the, the pharma VCs who are very, very, very sophisticated or the, the kind of VCs who invest in medical devices and pharma companies, but they're not going to talk to you in your first year. They're not going to talk to you until, you know, you're looking for 5 million or 10, 10 million. They, they want you to be de-risked before that. Yeah. And how, how, how have you found collaborating with universities as well? We've had a great experience so far. Yeah, really great experience. So typically the way we, with the people we most often collaborate with are clinicians because clinicians have, and there's a really nice uh, complementarity and kind of win-win situation that we have the suite of tools that allows them to take a cohort that they already have a, a theoretical or a practical question they want to answer that they already have and have probably got some pilot data for or some really good lab data for and do it on a larger scale. Um, and uh, we, of course, then learn more about that cohort and, and that condition. And from the clinicians, we, we learn what the use cases are, you know, what the actual needs are of the, the patients. Um, or in our, in our case, because the, the treatments are still somewhat further away for Alzheimer's disease, 
learn what the most promising paths to to future treatments are. Yeah. Talk, talking of clinicians, I think Richard was waving waving his hand. So perhaps it'd be a good time to to bring the rest of the the panel uh, in for this discussion. Um, Richard, did did you have a a question? Yeah, I had a question for Brian, if that's possible, because um, my question and answer box only allows me to answer questions, not ask them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Brian, thanks very much. Um, in, in terms of, sort of drug development in a preclinical stage, yeah. the, the golden ticket seems to be to find a surrogate marker that's going to be able to measure change over a relatively short period of time, you know, three to six months, because otherwise... Yeah trials are going on for five years, yep. and a marker that um, is a surrogate for neuronal loss and gets rid of the variance in an individual and gets rid of the variance, you know, day to day. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this approach that you're using is, the, is heading towards that um, and can provide that kind of facility? Well, certainly that's our ambition. That's that's my uh, my scientific hunch. Let's call it. I mean, it still needs to be proven. We're doing. Um, we're just about to start a a trial, a phase one B trial of an Alzheimer's drug, in the next few weeks. Um, we are running at the moment together with Queen's University Belfast, University Strathclyde, and, and also a couple of the other NHS uh, trusts in Scotland, a study with uh, amnestic mild cognitive impairment patients some of whom will have the supporting biomarkers to determine whether their pathology, whether it's, uh, you know, there's, there's an underlying Alzheimer's disease pathology. So that's, there are certainly the questions we're trying to answer. I think, you know, in the larger scheme of things, um, I think you're right on the money there for the three to six months. So I think one thing that has happened, I think this relates to what you said earlier as well, Charlie, about, you know, devices versus pharma. What has happened in the pharma world over the last couple of, the world, couple of years is that all the people who believed and made massive bets on amyloid therapies, amyloid mechanism therapies working are kind of, a lot of them got very nervous. And there's one person, there's one or two still standing out there kind of out on the end of the, um, the I forgot what you call it, the, the board you've got on a pirate ship, you know, they're out over the sea. And, um, and we'll see, you know, whether what Biogen comes up with, whether they get approved by the FDA or not. But I think even if they do get FDA approval, um, it's clear that the amyloid therapies that have come out so far, if they work, have a really quite marginal positive benefit, uh, benefit right? Um, so what that has done, that's in fact, at first, kind of everyone kind of got scared and say, okay, everyone's jumping out of Alzheimer's. But what's really happened is that's opened up the field to all the people who want to do it in other ways. So there are a lot of people working in neuroinflammation, uh, neuroimmune, obviously, uh, synaptic dysfunction, neuroprotection, and there's, you know, there are loads and loads of young biotechs Okay, the, these are companies who have, have like funding of millions, but are like tiny compared to Pfizer, for example, who have got loads and loads of different ideas and approaches and also really interesting medical device um, approaches. And what that means then, because we're moving that way, what happened in Alzheimer's was, in Alzheimer's uh, drug development was, they've been trying for such a long time to get amyloid to work and it kept on not working. They kept on saying, well, the reason it's not working is because we haven't got early enough. So they're going earlier and earlier and earlier. And then the earlier you go, the harder it is to determine that the people are actually sick or have that pathology. And then you have these big, massive cohorts full of people who may not actually have the disease you're, you're aiming to treat. Um, and so what it's moving back towards now when we're looking for these uh, new drug mechanisms is you can go for these shorter trials, as you say, three to six months. And the other thing it means is that depending on the kind of drug or the kind of medical device, what you want to measure may be quite different. So we need to have, I think, have a broad suite as a community. We need to have a broad suite of measures that measure both underlying brain activity like this, but also all the symptomatology, right? So you want to measure things like sleep and sleep quality, uh, sleep staging. You would like to be able to measure uh, people's disordered thinking through speech, for example, you would like to be uh, like to be able to measure gait on a large scale. And I think it's by having that whole ecosystem of different, uh, sorry to use a you know kind of a businessy word, but uh, that whole space of different uh, technologies and metrics, you know, with different sorts of evidence, qualitatively different evidence at a large scale, is I think what what will make a big difference. Thanks. Well, you were you were nodding a bit there. Have you got anything to? To add, add to that. Um, so let, let me start by just asking Brian a question because it was a really stimulating talk and I have a couple of questions in fact. The, the first is just about the path to moving a technology like this out towards um, the outside world. Um, you know at this point it sounds 
like it still is very, very challenging to get, uh, to get a toehold that's stable. Um, you know, there are three kinds of general approaches. One is making it a consumer technology somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is, um, you know, trying to find ways in which it can save hospitals money. Um, and um, uh, the third would be to show that it's, um, you know, it, it contributes to pharma development or, or monitoring. Um, can you balance the pros and cons of those different approaches and um, uh, think of and tell us about your experience in moving out of the sort of hand-to-mouth academic world where you're going from grant to grant? Um, well, let's see. The, the last point first, um, the uh, moving from the academic world to the business of business funding world is uh, more stressful, but things move a lot more quickly. I think everything happens more quickly. Uh, so it, from that point of view, it's been very satis satisfying. And, and, you know, so far we've been lucky. You know, we're, we're still here five years later and, and we're running great studies and we're getting good investments. So um, on the, the different use cases, certainly I would aspire to uh, so what, what you would love to have, right? So let's, let's look ahead. Like, what would you love to have? You'd love to have a technology that would allow you to very non, let's see, obviously non-invasively, like a technology like, like EG, but also in a lower profile without having to put a big thing on your head and sit down and do a load of games. You'd like to be able to more passively or more kind of within the fabric of people's daily life, measure these specific things. And I think there is promise for that. So, I mean, there are some really nice, uh, first of all, there are two companies. One is Kernel, the other one is uh, Open Water, which have got really disruptive technologies, uh, which may totally change the way we can uh, measure brain activity. Um, and uh, I think they're still, you know, probably still 10 years away at least, but still, I think there's, there's promise. Um, just with EEG, there are people doing really great things like kind of round ear, behind ear, in ear um, EEG, which means that you could also just measure EEG activity while you're going around. Like why not, you know, why should somebody have to sit down and play a game? Why not measure brain activity while you're driving your car and use um, computer, oh, sorry, my phone, use computer vision uh, technology to uh, work out what the cognitive load is of driving your car, for instance, or why not play real computer games and measure brain activity during that rather than constructed uh, games like the ones we have. Um, now, if you could, that'd be one future you get to where you could imagine, let's just be, and, and also it should be cheap, right? It should be cheap and easy to use. You could imagine, let's start just mass uh, monitoring of people's cognitive health from, you know, why not from the age of 40? You know, because it's usually between the age of 40 to 55, people start to feel mortal, right? Uh, kind of become kind of sort of mortality and start to think, oh, maybe I should start to take care of myself. So you can imagine that and you could have this beautiful future where if you walk into your, um, your GP at the age of 65 and say, mm, not sure, have noticed maybe something, or my wife or my husband said, or my daughter said they noticed something funny, that they've got this track record. You can say, you know, what is your normal? You know, what is your uh, track record being in brain activity, resting brain activity, uh, you know, arousal, uh, different sort of episodic or recollection memory, recognition memory. You could have, have traces of all that, which would be a great thing, right? Um, a big challenge there, though, then is in the meantime, that's far away technologically. In the meantime, how do you get people to do something along those lines? Now, we've been very successful with research studies and people will do it for a while, but sooner or later, they'll stop doing it because there isn't a benefit. Um, what I would see as being kind of a, a, an intermediate stepping stone, um, and I think this goes back to actually one of the questions I see her about, for example, the finger study and diet, is you could imagine having something which is something like a lifestyle coach. So you say, you know, based on this demographic ba database, here is uh, a person of your age and profile, your level of education, gender, for example, with your sorts of sleeping patterns. If they sleep 30 minutes more per night, their memory performance goes up by X percent. And you could you could suggest that to them, and then you'd monitor it, monitor both their memory, their, sorry, their sleep uh, patterns, and then also see does it have an effect. And you could, I think, that could help people. I mean, I've personally found with just even tracking uh, steps and sleep uh, with an activity tracker, I've improved the amount I move around and how well I sleep. Um, although I do stop using it after a while because I can sort that, and then um, so I think there would be a challenge there. Um, but anyway, we as a company right now, uh, I mean, that's a hard sell, right? So you'd have to go out to a venture, a very uh, kind of visionary venture capitalist who will say, I'm prepared to throw a few hundred million in because that's how much money you'd have to spend to do something on a really large scale. Um, well, certainly tens of millions anyway. Um, 
to kind of see if that works, right? Um, so we as a company, what we're doing is we're concentrating on working with clinicians, working with academics, working with pharma companies who actually understand the technology. They see immediately the value of EEG and the, co the cognitive uh, behavioral indices. And we can build our evidence base and work from there. But I, I mean, I'd love to, you know, the thing I also dream of doing is why not go to one of the big agencies and say, say, say in the future, I can make this headset for say 200 pounds or 300 pounds, which is not impossible in the future at scale. Why not run like a massive study where you do, um, you know, a large epidemi epidemiological study or community study, you say 8,000 people follow them, follow them for 10 years. You know, that's, that's doable. We can do that today. No, that's great. I mean, the second question, you you started to touch on it with your mention of kernel and open water. Could you give us just an outline of what the disruptive uh, electrode technologies are that are coming forward to you know, increase the density of data that you get and the ease with which it can be acquired? Sure. Uh, so, um, the, so open water is uh, s set up by uh, somebody from who used to be a media lab. She did the one laptop for child you might've heard of. So she's a really kind of visionary technologist and um, Mary Lou Jesper Jesperson is her name. And uh, she has this vision of using um, a set of technologies to send light through the brain and then to be able to reconstruct how the light diffuses and to have, you know, if, so I'm not a physicist, so I'm not a biophysicist, so, so I can't, uh, I, I can't uh, judge how likely this, this is to work. But um, there are serious, I think, scientific and technological work that suggests that it may be possible to get uh, kind of the temporal resolution of EEG and better than the spatial res resolution of MRI to measure both blood flow and electrical activity um, in the brain. Um, which of course would be spectacular and, and using uh, technologies which uh, come out of the kind of basically kind of mobile telephone or portable electronics um, industries. And so you could imagine being mass produced and cheap. Um, and that kernel have a, a basically a wearable MEG, which I think at the moment is still, um, I think it's still, you know, the basic components still cost more than I think $30,000 or something. But, you know, if that becomes cheaper, um, that could be really powerful. That was some really nice pilot data with Kernel that just came out a few months ago. They were totally secretive just a few months ago. They came out with that. And they've also got some basically kind of a, a development of FNIRs, a functional near infrared, um, which I think is less developed. But I think those are the two ones. I think, you know, Elon Musk, I think what he's done is, is really cool, but it's obviously invasive. And, um, you know, there's, there's very clear kind of physical and technological limitations to scanning a whole brain in that way, as opposed to just one little bit of the brain. Um, so I think, um, you know, it clearly could be of, of interest, despite loads of scientific and technological, um, what's it called, uh, barriers could be of interest for people who've lost the use of a limb or, you know, people who are paralyzed and so on and so forth. But I think it's, I think, for what we are talking about, I don't think it's it's really very relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Brian, you, you mentioned um, Elon Musk. Uh, Richard, when you talk to, to patients, do they worry about some of these ultra futuristic technologies or, or are they just really excited that there's a possibility that these things really might make a, a huge difference? Um, I think they're pretty much focused on what can help them now. Um, the impression that I tend to get is that uh, at a certain age group, there's understandably um, a bit of apprehension and fear regarding technologies. Um, I think that's changing, you know, even in the times that I've been doing memory clinics, um, we see a great change in the number of people who are using smartphones and using lots of apps on smartphones, for instance. So, you know, th that is moving through, you know, the, the older sort of sections of society. Um, and I think that, you know, as the technology advances, that will sort of permeate through um, the old populations as well, and there'll be less fear of that. And, you know, part of the difficulty, of course, is that um, not everybody has a family or a carer to help them. Um, and um, often we develop approaches that work for somebody who's got you know, a, a daughter or a husband or somebody who, who can help them with these technologies. Um, but for those people who don't have that support network, technology can be um, you know, quite a challenge and quite an anxiety provoking situation. So, you know, it, it, it needs support um, and I think it will change. 
um, you know, as the years go by and older people use more technology. Um, and it's very different at the early stages of the condition to the late stages of the condition. As I was saying earlier, there's a, a huge spectrum over you know, many years of, of different needs and capabilities. And cl clearly, uh, identifying dementia at an early stage is incredibly important. And, and there's, Brian's mentioned gaming um, earlier. If we could actually just monitor people when, when they're, they're gaming, that might be really interesting way do you think um working with other sectors so rona you you work in uh, wearables do you think working perhaps more with consumer electronics companies and things like that getting them involved at an early stage would, would be useful um I, I, sorry is that really sorry i wasn't sure who it was addressed to you so. sorry rona, rona have you got got something to um, what I was going to say was that there is increasing evidence, and I think UK DRI is involved in this as well, in the idea of smart homes um, and using smart technology that's consumer based um, to identify cognitive impairment as it comes on and potentially to identify what type of cognitive impairment a person has. I know that the, there's a the UK DRI, there's Orca Tech in America that does it, um, Radar and AD are looking at wearable consumer devices that might be useful for it. So I think it will grow, but it's um, making sure that it's clinically relevant and that clinicians are on board with it as well. One of the biggest and most important things with my work was that we had clinicians who helped us with the diagnosis so that we could ascertain who had dementia at Lewy bodies. And um, also increasingly important is in any of this work is to be following people up through to post-mortem so that we can be definite in what we're saying is true, which we're not, we're not at that stage yet. Uh, Charlie, could I ask Rihanna another question? Um, just going back to um, your study, uh, Brian described to us how he was using his device, which was with a, effectively with a series of program challenges where they were answering, subjects were answering questions and doing a game. Do you think that, have you found that with uh, specific challenges, the gait analysis is more informative, such as you know coming across um, obstacles or steps or something of that nature. So we did examine um, dual task gates, which is when you're walking while doing another cognitive task. And there's a lot of evidence out there that says that's very predictive of developing dementia who will go on to develop it. So if a person really struggles with a dual task or has a significantly slower walk and that, usually that would signify that they're at much more risk. In my case, they, they were quite established already, and I found that actually it made differentiation much harder because it made people with Alzheimer's much worse when they were walking, but people with dementia at Lewy bodies kind of stayed the same. I suspect that they couldn't add an extra cognitive load to their walking. The walking was already enough of a cognitive load. Um, and that's, it's quite important then when we think about how that translates into remote monitoring and how we go into the real world, because we found that real world walking and Parkinson's is most similar to dual task gates because it requires so much cognitive function when you're walking. So you can imagine if you're walking through a house holding a cup of tea, that's a huge cognitive task to do for a person with dementia. Um, and I think we need to explore it better in the real world by having cameras on people, understanding what they're doing, understanding what their gait is doing in that aspect. But it's just a very intrusive thing to do and to, to ethically look at it would be possibly quite hard. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it did. It's a good, good answer. We've got a question here. Um, sorry, there's, there's no name here, but they ask, um, would language and speech, uh, which is, can be uh, analysed through artificial intelligence uh, approaches, this is a, a rapidly growing field in, in dementia. What, what, what are your, your views on, on this area? Um, Paul, are you able to, to answer that? Uh, well, I'll, I'll make a, a brief answer and then switch to Richard. Um, I, I think it's very promising. Um, there have been some exciting post-mortem analyses of great novelists, for example, famously Iris Murdoch, uh, looking at uh, her novels um, over the years up to the point at which she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And what was clear is that her word choice uh, was progressively diminishing, her grammar was becoming more simplistic, and um, 
and there were a number of other, and there were some other features that were picked out, uh, really defining this um, uh, this trajectory of her own subclinical dementia leading into Alzheimer's disease. Um, I think it's hugely promising, and um, uh, speech uh, fluency, um, uh, as well as, as grammar and word choice, uh, play into this. Uh, but um, uh, I, I think that the, the challenge is, uh, and it's also potentially easily cl made clinically meaningful because the relationship between speech and the impact on everyday life is so close. So um, I think the tools are starting to, you know, are, are there. And, um, uh, you know, it's actually perhaps surprising that we haven't seen more of it, except that it is so invasive and personal. But Richard, what, what are your views? I think it's another one of these promising approaches. Um, you know, I've spoken to people about you know approaches to language. I've spoken to people about approaches to typing um, and typing cadence and speed. So um, th there's a lot of different ways into this. I think part of the difficulty is that it's fairly easy to get to 80, 85% accuracy. But it's very difficult to get from 85% accuracy to 98% accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's relatively straightforward to develop a novel kind of investigative technique that will um, work up to 80%, but then not be better than what we've got at the moment. So the, the key is targeting the, um, the innovation to add to what is there and to add to a scenario where it's going to provide um, value in the future. And it goes back to that um, issue that we were discussing with Brian about preclinical state. So um, would language, would interpretation of language really hit on that you know, preclinical state? You know, how, how far will it go back? You know, what's the variation with an individual? So, um, you know, those are, those are my thoughts about it, is, is that it, it's not a problem to get accurate. The problem is getting accurate enough. Um, and, you know, those extra percentage points on the accuracy, they get to get harder and harder. Mm -hmm. Could I add something to that? Please, please do, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, so one issue there is, I agree with everything you guys were saying, one issue, I think, is specificity. So there was some, there was some early work, I think, around 2012 by IBM Research finding, for example, patterns in sentence structure from people with schizophrenia, that their sentence structure would be somehow disordered or, or rambling. Um, there's obviously a lot of work in, uh, in Parkinson's and other motor-related disorders on uh, articulation, you know, motor articulation. And then I think we do want to be specific if we're talking about Alzheimer's disease to be looking at what we expect Alzheimer's disease specifically to affect, which I would think may be um, word retrieval. Um, so that you could you could try and look at that or, or also, as you were saying there, um, the the complexity of the vocabulary they're using. Um, I think it is one of the beautiful things about it is people use language all the time. So if you can address it in a way that uh, respects people's privacy, number one, from a technical point of view, respects people's privacy, which is very easy to do, but number two, convinces people that you're respecting their privacy, right, which is a trust thing. Um, then it could be something that just happens, you know, when, on, on your mobile telephone, every time you type a text message, every time you speak into your phone, you could be extracting metrics without recording anything anyone is saying, you can be extracting aggregate metrics or kind of abstract metrics that say, you know, the word retrieval uh, index for this conversation was X, you know, or the, the, the vocabulary complexity was Y or the sentence complexity was Z. Um, so I, I see it as, as a beautiful, just like you were saying, Richard, something that you could have running in the background from, from you know, the moment you start using a mobile telephone, you know, why not? Um, if, if people are, can be made comfortable about it. And that's our job, of course, to, to uh, communicate that effectively and um, uh, convince people to con contribute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, we've reached um, 12 o'clock, so we'll, we'll have to wrap up this session now. But I'd just like to say a very big thank you to all of the presenters today. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, and a big thank you to everyone uh, for, for your questions as well. Um, just, just to note, the presentations will be available um, shortly uh, afterwards. And this video will be um, up on YouTube in the next couple of days if you'd like to, to re-watch. Um, but yeah, so finally, a big, big thank you to, to all of you. Thank you very much.